I know you guys ask a lot of questions. I love that you're hungry for knowledge and you ask lots of questions. I do think, though, there are a lot of questions about Hoi4 that have gone unanswered for a very long time. And we need to find out what are the most popular questions regarding Hearts of Iron 4. And what a better place to look other than Google to find out the questions that you, you are asking. Hoi4, is anti-tank worth it? In single player against the AI, the answer is no, it really isn't. Uh, for the most part, anti-tank does two things. It adds piercing, which allows you to remove the tank buff, which reduces your organization faster. And it also does a second thing, which offers you hard attack, which does more damage to harder divisions, mechanized, motorized, and armor divisions, which tend to come more late game. And as you can see here, uh, it offers a small amount of soft attack, which is decent to begin with in 936, but that little bit of soft attack and a little bit of defense falls off massively as the game progresses so in that circumstance anti-tank is it worth it in ai single player games nah it really isn't for the most part anti-tank is poo next question hoi4 is recon worth it so these are all the questions surprisingly that i feel like i relate to because these are questions that i brought up at some point in the past and i just don't really feel very connected with them so recon has gone through quite a few changes recently it's like a stat uh, that allows you to more likely select tactics that will be beneficial depending on the doctrine you've gone for. From testing in the past, it, it was noted that if you selected tactics, let's say an example, elastic defense, you are more likely to get a tactic that counters an enemy tactic. So therefore, you're more likely to defend more effectively. And therefore, it was more effective to have high reconnaissance on defensive divisions. So you're more likely to counter enemy tactics. It did find out that it would give you about 20% or 30% bonus to defending if you were a defensive division that high reconnaissance however reconnaissance has changed as well because reconnaissance also now gives extra intelligence so the idea is you know more about the enemy and because you know more about the enemy you're able to counter the enemy's tactic by giving you more intelligence which is all to do with the intelligence agency more intelligence will give you more intel on that specific country so therefore when you've got more intelligence on that country you're able to get an intel attack bonus, which is up to like 15% maximum bonus, which is overall 15% extra attack bonus. It's not something to be ignored. That's a massive attack bonus in combat. I mean, that's the one reason to go for recon, but overall reconnaissance is not overall that great unless you are defending. There is one, however, the one, however, is motorized reconnaissance, and it gives you good bonuses. If you look closely to movement speed, 20% over desert, 15% for planes, and you can see most of the time, speed bonuses if you're focusing on a fast tank division or a fast motorized division motorized reconnaissance will make you go zoom zoom a little bit faster so that's the one instance where i feel like it's worth it but whether you stack in reconnaissance i don't think it's really worth it next up hoi4 is anti-air worth it let's hold the worth it ones isn't it now this is the one time where i will disagree and push against the community for the most part anti-air is great anti-air is really great the minimum level of anti-air you should have on your divisions particularly your offensive divisions is support anti-air which is the very very first tier that one it gives a decent amount of piercing gives a reasonable amount of air attack and plus all the other stats get a bit of a, a slight buff as well there's no reason why you shouldn't have a little bit of anti-air on and i wish the ai would put more anti-air on its divisions as well because that's usually the reason why when you make cast spam it's so unbelievably effective because ai just isn't adding on support aa support aa is unbelievably good so for the most part if you're adding on at least 10 air attack you're going to be a really really good position and you get 15 from the very first level so 10 is easy to come by is cavalry good Wow, this is a good question. These are all the best questions. I have made a dedicated video to this, so you can check that video out as well. The an easy answer to this question is horses in Hoi 4 are actually really, really strong. The, the times when they're not as effective are like times where it's getting late game and some of the extra passive bonuses don't apply to horses, so you don't tend to benefit as much of a late game situation. And also you get attack penalties in different terrain types, which can eat into the amount of damage you can be doing. Overall, you don't want to be poking into jungles or mountains or amphibious with horses because the penalties you're going to experience are going to be astronomically huge. Overall, though, you have the ability to stack a bunch of general traits with horses you can't do with infantry. Infantry leader works on cavalry. Cavalry leader works on cavalry. You've also got an extra one here. Proper heritage, extra 5% attack. There are so many different traits and modifiers that you can stack on top of horses, giving 1930s horses some insane attack capabilities. Horse is definitely strong. Of course, motorized gives better stats. Mechanized gives even better stats. And tanks are just king. So obviously, horses do fall off 
about mid-1943. Next up, is strategic bombing worth it? I think I can give a short answer to this one. No, it really isn't. The production cost of strategic bombers is incredibly high and the actual amount of payoff you get from it is significantly small. Maybe there's a strategy where you assign one or two mills into strategic bombers and then you, you, you give a little bit of bombing damage overall or if you escort them with fighters. Something I haven't really tested out in the long run. But overall, strategic bombing does very little damage to industry. It's very small unless you get a critical mass, which you dedicate all your industry to. Overall, it's a fun gimmick. It's a bit of fun. You played a multiplayer game before and someone's met strategic bombers and you'd be like, whoa, they're so OP. It's because they dedicate the entire industry to do it. But for the most part, as a part of your strategy, now, strategic bombers are poo. I can't recommend them in a normal game. We're going to go with Hoi 4R. Hoi 4 Area Defense. So this used to be called Garrison Order. It's this button here. Can you see this area defense? And you select areas, and depending on what criteria you want to be guarded, they'll move into that specific area. It's really useful if you want to guard a coastline just to grab the, all the coastline and mark off only ports. And that means ports will be defended. The AI will land next to it, and then the AI will automatically, as part of a garrison order, try to repel that invasion but hold on to the ports itself. It's really powerful, actually, because the AI makes the mistake of not grabbing ports in these kind of naval invasions. Next up, are railway guns good? The short answer? Yes, railway guns are really strong, particularly to counter enemy forts. So, support companies, scroll down. Dora the Explorer Bombardment 25. So, it just like shore bombardment, reducing enemies' defense and enemies' attacking's breakthrough by a significant amount, an average about 10% usually. With that as well, it also has an ability to reduce the effectiveness of forts by 33%. So, if you ever want to do that really quirky, weird strategy where you break the Maginot line, railway artillery are the perfect things to do to break that. To be honest with you, overall, be aware if you don't have air superiority, these will get cast to death and you will need civilian factories to repair them. And of course, the upfront cost is quite high. I make a few of these and apart from that's pretty good are nukes worth it <laughs> nukes aren't actually that effective at bombing like victory points surprisingly they're actually the most effective when you bomb actual divisions on the front line because they reduce the org by half and they reduce the strength by half so this division here is an example we'll use this one actually this uh, big fat motorized division it has a manpower currently of where is it 11,000. So you're going to be losing 5,500 if you were to nuke this division. And if you find a situation where the AI is stacking loads of divisions in one location and you nuke this area, that's a huge amount of manpower lost in that location. And this will bleed into the, end, the AI's production, bleed into the AI's manpower. So eventually you'll be able to overcome them. So nukes are powerful. They do come kind of late game. If you super rush them by stacking all the modifiers for research, you can get the final nuke tech in 1943. Three. However, though, once again, most time in 943, if you're a decent player, you probably already won by that point, so it's kind of pointless. Motorized divisions, worth it? You know, th this is a good question because this is another popular one that came in. He asked quite frequently. Motorized on their own are actually really good in comparison to an infantry division. Let's actually compare. So let's make this. So this is just a pure infantry division, nothing else. Now we're basically going to convert this to a motorized infantry division. Let's check out the stats. So let's start off with the downside to this. The downside is using more supply but it's a very small amount it's going to consume fuel that's a potential downside as well the other downside to motorized is you do suffer from speed penalties and attack penalties in different terrain types where infantry don't suffer from extra penalties in certain terrains probably the worst of the worst does appear to be jungles and forests because you get a massive 50 percent speed bonus so basically the speed bonus in those terrain types kind of nullified no that's not true because it's 12 kilometers per hour so it's almost three times four times faster than infantry anyway so it's not even a big deal so you are going to be still a little bit faster than infantry anyway now let's talk about stats speed yeah three times faster surprisingly extra suppression i never even knew that so apparently motorized are good at suppression the added advantage as well is that motorized have some hardness so they will get less damage from partisans so that's just something to be aware of and overall you get a significant breakthrough bonus which is your ability to attack and it is attack division overall for the most part that's pretty much it it's a significantly more expensive division for speed and breakthrough there is a however though because the, most of the bonuses you get late game give a bigger bonus to motorize and they do leg infantry improved infantry equipment three gives a bigger bonus to mobile infantry than leg infantry so it's just something late game are tank destroyers worth it you know, I don't make them very often in game, but the answer is yes. Tank destroyers are great. Tank destroyers have slightly less supply, uh, but they lose a significant amount of breakthrough. But the bonus is you're still taking advantage of your hardness, your armor. You get a big bonus to hard attack overall.
And if you look closely, if you get the bonuses here to improve tank upgrades, you can see that tank destroyers do get more piercing and get more hard attack the more you progress down this path. And overall, that will result in more tank busting capabilities. Same as anti-tank. Basically, a tank destroyer is an anti-tank gun on wheels, basically. Here's the however, though. Unfortunately, however... The AI does not make tanks very effectively, so hard attack tends to go to waste. You're better off focusing on soft attack based tank divisions if you're facing against the AI in single player. Ah, uh, armored cars, good. So if you want to gain the most reconnaissance for your divisions, you are better off going for the armored recon, which gives you a plus two to reconnaissance for the infantry divisions. I suppose you could argue this could be effective defensively to get that counter for infantry divisions, but offensively, you probably want to better off going for the motorized, which gives the biggest speed buffs. Carriers, are they worth it? Yes, there was a bug in the olden days where carriers weren't using their naval attack force in battles. And because of that, the community kept repeating that carriers are useless, carriers are useless, carriers are useless. But now we're in a position where you understand that that carrier bug has been fixed and carriers are very, very effective. And for the most part, the only one weakness of carriers that makes them ineffective is bad weather because carriers can't take off if the weather's really really bad in that case you get around that by going for increment weather experience which will uh, nullify most of that penalty so the answer is yes carriers are very 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 good are fields hospitals worth it ah this is this this conversation has been beaten to death by the community now when are hot field hospitals useful they're useful for countries that have low manpower but a decent level of production and the sad part is there's not many nations that do have that an example let's say sweden that the overall population of sweden isn't very high however at the very start of the game you've got a fairly decent industry so you can support making the support equipment and you can also support making motorized which are quite high costs for field hospitals but then we move into towards france germany the uk and italy these nations have got an okay manpower pool so what are you actually preserving at that point not a lot the one other exception too is that if you are battle planning and yes, you, battle planning is your thing and you love to battle plan oh big borders battle plan yes and you don't really want to micro your troops individually my advice is field hospitals will benefit you a lot too so unfortunately field hospitals are kind of niche because they only really are most effective in that one off scenario ah tanks worth it i know where this has come from because like youtubers like torio primarily make infantry divisions and they don't really make tanks and tanks almost like come a little bit connected to the multiplayer community and less about single player so i kind of in a way i kind of get it why uh, people would ask that question the question is guys if you're able to make a combat width affected division 42 width 44 width or 45 width tank division and add logistics onto that to reduce the supply amount and use the right generals at the right times and also use the right terrain don't push into mountains over big rivers tanks are insanely effective you have seen it a big fat 45 width division push into poland here it is like a knife through butter no combat happens your tanks just roll over into the borders of poland you got to get it right though you got to get it right tanks are most effective in nations that have got good production and are able to actually make those big fat girthy divisions but overall guys if you are playing as let's say italy and you're trying to break through the alps you're gonna have a really hard time with tanks it's gonna be possible the damage is really great but overall it's not gonna be the best use of it okay finally hoi for what what is combat width? Oh man, what a big question. So every terrain type, if you look really closely and hover over it, it has a different combat width. Combat width is the maximum amount of divisions that can fit into that location to actually deal battle. If the combat width is reached its capacity, then a division will sit in reserve at the back, waiting for a division to fail on the front to move and reserve into the front line. And players like to mid-max the combat width of the division to try and get the maximum amount of firepower into the battle. The most optimal combat width is 10 width, but it's not very good for stats wise and the most optimal on the big end is like 42 44 and 45 but there are some on the lower end that are effective as well as long as you're making divisions between 10 width and 45 width they will be effective the way i always do it is you use the divisions the game gives you to begin with and then build them bigger and bigger and bigger as the game progresses as long as i've got the equipment to do that and the manpower to do that you will do totally and utterly fine the honest truth is we're not living in the age anymore that combat width mid maxing is the meta anymore for the most part, anything between 10 
and 45 works. However, there are some that are slightly more effective than others. And I have made a dedicated video to that. So check out that video. What does infrastructure do? It kind of does two things. It increases the resources from that set region. So if you go for this here, you can see that we gain two extra aluminium for upgrading and also an extra 15 steel from upgrading this region too. And also when you do upgrade it, you gain a higher percentage of construction during that region as well. There is like a strategy where if you have an area that has a high amount of factories at like the areas that are in blue if you max the infrastructure in these regions first before building factories in them you will actually get the most efficient building out of these regions in the long game however the payoff for that is quite late game so if you're playing a short game where you're going to tap out in 1942 or 43 this strategy won't be effective for you. But if you play more of a long game, it will be more effective. Overall, in my games, you never see me do this. My strategy is usually civilian factories to begin with, military factories just before the war, and then late game, if you're running out of resources and you can't import them anymore, you start to build a big bunch of infrastructure to maintain as much resources as possible while also going for excavation as well what do you do after world war ii the sad part of this question is there is nothing else to do they've got two choices you can hold for you either create your own world war you end world war ii and go for a war conquest or you end world war ii and then you close the game there really isn't any late game content for hoi for once you've researched everything after 1945 ish it's technically already over unless you're going for a world conquest what is mobilization speed this is such a small one but we'll, we'll we'll just cover it now anyway so if you look really closely on your manpower at the top you can see total manpower is six four six thousand and then you've got one percent eligible population that can be recruited into the manpower pool whenever you change your mobilization law you will not get that manpower immediately it will basically creep up from one percent up to the mobilization law you've changed so from this case 1.5 percent to 2.5 percent so what's going to happen now is when i play the game it's going to creep up from one percent and mobilize every single day by 0.003 percent until it gets to the next tick of manpower and there you go you can see it's gone 1.1 percent manpower has been recruitable now as it ticks up what mobilization speed is, is you now will recruit population and mobilize faster than you did before. What support companies do you use? I feel that's a dedicated video. I think that's a dedicated video. I think we could basically make a tier list based on support equipment. But haven't we already done that? Yeah, we have already done that. Okay, in that case, watch the video on support equipment. Give that video a watch. Give it a click. What do field marshals do? They basically give stats to the generals underneath them. So in this case, Mr. Montgomery has a logistical wizard, which half of those stats will apply to all the divisions underneath him. Now, be aware, though, he's massively overstat because the AI likes to do that, and that will cause a penalty to how much you will gain that. But also, look, he's got an extra 7.5% extra attack. Half of that will then be given to the generals underneath him. So the idea is you level up a general to high as you possibly can promote him to a field marshal give him the best traits and best stats and then give him a good general below him to level that guy up too what do civilian factories do they bake production of your country so every single civilian factory will be added to the construction queue more civilian factories more construction queue what planes to put on carriers they specifically have to be carrier based planes so in this case you can see this icon this basically is a carrier based plane they are a little bit more expensive and the stats aren't as good as well but these are the ones you'll put on to your carriers what to do when capitulate what does this mean is it basically mean like you're poland and you've capitulated what do you do at that point i suppose that's a good question i guess because to be fair you're a government in exile and you're kind of fighting behind the front line the process for this is you build legitimacy as a government in exile and with more legitimacy you gain more manpower you get more generals and you gain more equipment that you can use poland and the netherlands and france are the only three nations that can kind of go into exile and you've still got a focus tree which gives you loads of factories off map so you can continue to fight the war from abroad but every other nation when you capitulate you just be used as standard government in exile mechanics which for the most part is just based on clicking decisions here there's not a great lot to do to be fair that's what usually why you don't really want to go into exile to be honest with you did you enjoy a q a if you got any other questions i could do in the second round of these please comment below apart from that don't forget to like and subscribe and i'll see you next time click this video this is the one that will lead you to a happy eternal life